Now there were three of us sitting in the waiting room, waiting to hear how Dally and Johnny were. Then the reporters and police came. They asked too many questions too fast and got me mixed up. If you want to know the truth, I wasn't feeling real good in the first place. Kind of sick, really. And I'm scared of policemen anyway. The reporters fired one question right after another at me and got me so confused that I didn't know what was coming off. Derry finally told them that I wasn't in any shape to be yelled at so much, and they slowed down a little. Derry's kind of big. Soda, Soda Pop kept them in stitches. He'd grab one guy's press hat and another's camera and walk around interviewing the nurses and mimicking TV reporters. He tried to lift a policeman's gun and grin so crazily when he got caught that the policeman had to grin too. Soda can make anyone grin. I managed to get a hold of some hair grease and comb my hair back so that it looked a little better before they got any pictures. I'd die if I got my picture in the paper with my hair looking so lousy. Derry and Soda Pop were in the pictures too. Jerry Wood told me that if Soda Pop and Derry hadn't been so good looking, they wouldn't have taken so many. That was public appeal, he said. Soda was really getting a kick out of all this. I guess he would have enjoyed it more if it hadn't been so serious, but he couldn't resist anything that caused that much excitement. I swear, sometimes he reminds me of a cult, a long-legged Palomino cult that he has to get his nose into everything. The reporter stared at him admiringly. I told you he looks like a movie star, and he kind of radiates. Finally, even Soda Pop got tired of the reporter. He gets bored with the same old thing after a time. And stretched out on the long bench, he put his head on Derry's lap and went to sleep. I guess both of them were tired. It was late at night, and I knew that they hadn't slept much during the week. Even while I was answering questions, I remembered that it had only been a few hours since I was sleeping off a smoke in the corner of the church. Already, it was an unreal dream, and yet, at the same time, I couldn't have imagined any other world. Finally, the reporters started to leave, along with the police. One of them turned, turned and asked, what would you do right now if you could do anything you wanted? I looked at him tiredly. Take a bath? They thought that was pretty funny, but I meant it. I felt lousy. The hospital got real quiet after they left. The only noise was the nurse's soft footsteps and Soda's light breathing. Derry looked down at him and grinned half-heartedly. He didn't get much sleep this week, he said softly. He hardly slept at all. Hmm, Soda said drowsily. You didn't either. The nurses wouldn't tell us anything about Johnny and Dally, so Derry got a hold of the doctor. The doctor told us that we could that he could only talk to family, but Derry finally got it through the guy's head that we were about as much family as Dally and Johnny had. Dally would be okay after two or three days in the hospital, he said. One arm was badly burned and would be scarred for the rest of his life, but he would have full use of it in a couple of weeks. Dally will be okay, I thought. Dallas was always okay. He could take anything. It was Johnny I was worried about. He was in critical condition. His back had been broken when the piece of timber fell on him. He was in severe shock and suffering from third-degree burns. They were doing everything they could to ease the pain, although since his back was broken, he couldn't even feel the burns below his waist. He kept calling for Dallas and Pony Boy. If he lived, if? Please, no, I thought, please not if. The blood was draining from my face and Derry put an arm across my shoulder and squeezed hard. Even if he lived, he'd be crippled for the rest of his life. You wanted it straight and you got it straight, the doctor said. Now go home and get some rest. I was trembling. A pain was going in my throat and I wanted to cry, but greasers don't cry in front of strangers. Some of us never cry at all, like Dally and Tubid and Tim Shepard. They forgot how at an early age. Johnny crippled for life? I'm dreaming, I thought in panic. I'm dreaming. I'll wake up at home or in the church and everything will be like it used to be. But I didn't believe myself. Even if Johnny lived, he'd be crippled and never play football or help us out in a rumble again. He'd have to stay in the house that he hated, where he wasn't wanted, and things could never be like they used to be. I didn't trust myself to speak. If I said one word, the hard knot in my throat would swell and I'd be crying in spite myself. I took a deep breath and kept my mouth shut. Soda was awake by then and thought, and although he looked stony-faced, as if he hadn't heard a word the doctor had said, his eyes were bleak and stunned. Serious reality has a hard time coming through to Soda, but when it does, it hits him hard. He looked like I felt when I had seen that black-haired Soch lying doubled up and still in the moonlight. Derry was rubbing the back of my head softly. We better get home. We can't do anything here. In our ford, I was suddenly overcome by sleepiness. I leaned back and closed my eyes, and we were home before I knew it. Soda was shaking me gently. Hey, pony boy, wake up. We still got to get in the house. Mm -hmm, I said sleepily and lay down in the seat. I couldn't have gotten up to save my life. I could hear Soda and Derry, but as if from a great distance. Oh, come on, pony boy, Soda pleaded, shaking me a little harder. We're sleepy, too. I guess Derry was tired of fooling around because he picked me up and carried me in. 
He's getting mighty big to be carried, Soda said. I wanted to tell him to shut up and let me sleep, but I only yawned. He sure lost a lot of weight, Derry said. I thought sleepily that I should at least pull off my shoes, but I didn't. I went to sleep the minute Derry tossed me on the bed. I'd forgotten how soft a bed really was. I was the first one up the next morning. Soda must have pulled my shoes and shirt off for me. I was still wearing my jeans. He must have been too sleepy to undress himself, though. He lay stretched out beside me, fully clothed. I wiggled out from under his arm and pulled the blanket up over him and went to take a shower. Asleep, he looked a lot younger than going on 17, but I had noticed that Johnny looked younger when he was asleep too, so I figured everyone did. Maybe people are younger when they are asleep. After my shower, I put on some clean clothes and spent five minutes or so hunting for a hint of beard on my face and mourning over my hair. That bum haircut made my ears stick out. Derry was still asleep when I went to the kitchen to fix breakfast. The first one up has to fix breakfast and the other two do the dishes. That's the rule at our house. And it's usually Derry who fixes breakfast and me and Soda who are left with the dishes. I hunted through the ice box and found some eggs. We all like our eggs done differently. I like them hard. Derry likes them in a bacon and tomato sandwich. And Soda Pop eats his with grape jelly. All three of us like chocolate cake for breakfast. Mom had never allowed it with the allowed it with ham and eggs, but Derry and so let Soda and me talk him into it. We really didn't have to twist his arm. Derry loves chocolate cake as much as we do. Soda Pop always makes sure there's some in the icebox every night, and if there isn't, he cooks one up real quick. I like Derry's cakes better. Soda Pop puts way too much sugar in the icing. I didn't see how he stands jelly and eggs and chocolate cake all at once, but he seems to like it. Derry drinks black coffee, and Soda Pop and I drink chocolate milk. We could have coffee if we wanted it, but we like chocolate milk. All three of us are crazy about chocolate stuff. Soda says if they ever make a chocolate cigarette, I'll have it made. Anybody home? A familiar voice called out from the front screen, and Two-Bit and Steve came in. We always just stick our heads in each other's houses and holler, hey, and walk in. Our front door is always unlocked in case one of the boys is hacked off at his parents and needs a place to lay over and cool off. We never could tell who we'd find stretched out on the sofa in the morning. It was usually Steve, whose father told him about once a week to get out and never come back. It kind of bugs Steve, even if his old man does give him five or six bucks the next day to make up for it. Or it might be Dally, who lived anywhere he could. Once we even found Tim Shepard, leader of the Shepard gang, and far off his own turf, reading the morning paper in the armchair. He merely looked up, said hi, and strolled out without staying for breakfast. Two-Bit's mother warns us about burglars, but Derry, flexing his muscles so that they bulged like oversized baseballs, drawled that he wasn't afraid of any burglars and that we didn't really have anything worth taking. He'd risk the robbery, he said, if it meant keeping one of the boys from blowing up and robbing a gas station or something, so the door was never locked. In here, I yelled, forgetting that Derry and Soda Pop were asleep. Don't slam the door. They slammed the door, of course, and Tubit came running into the kitchen. He caught me by the upper arms and swung me around, ignoring the fact that I had two uncooked eggs in my hands. Hey, pony boy, he cried gleefully. Long time no see. You would have thought it had been five years in, instead of five days since I'd seen him last, but I didn't mind. I like old Two-Bit. He's a good buddy to have. He spun me into Steve, who gave me a playful slap on my bruised back and shoved me across the room. One of the eggs went flying. It landed on the clock, and I tightened my grip on the other one so that it crushed and ran all over my hand. Now look what you did, I griped. There went our breakfast. Can't you two wait till I set the eggs down before you go shoving me all over the country? I really was a little mad because I just realized how long it had been since I'd eaten anything. The last thing I'd eaten was a hot fudge sundae at the Dairy Queen in Windricksville, and I was hungry. Two-Bit was walking in a slow circle around me, and I sighed because I knew what was coming. Man, dig baldy here. He was staring at my head as he circled me. I wouldn't have believed it. I thought all the wild Indians in Oklahoma had been tamed. What little squaw's gone off with that tough-looking mop of yours, pony boy? I'll lay off, I said. I wasn't feeling too good in the first place, kind of like I was coming down with something. Two-Bit winked at Steve, and Steve said, why, he had to get a haircut to get his picture in the paper. They'd never believe a greasy-looking mug could be a hero. How do you like being a hero, big shot? How do I like what? Being a hero, you know. He shoved the morning paper at me impatiently, like a big shot even. I stared at the newspaper. On the front page of the second section was the headline, Juvenile Delinquents Turn Heroes. What I like is the turn bit, Tubit said, cleaning the egg off the floor. Y'all were heroes from the beginning. Y you just didn't turn all of a sudden. I hardly heard him. I was reading the paper. The whole page was covered with stories about us. The fight, the murder, the church burning, the socias being drunk, everything. My picture was there with Derry and Soda Pop. 
The article told how Johnny and I had risked our lives saving those little kids. And there was a comment from one of the parents who said that they all would have burned to death if it hadn't been for us. It told the whole story of our fight with the Soches, only they didn't say Soches because most grown-ups don't know about the battles that go on between us. They had interviewed Cherry Valance, and she said that Bob had been drunk and the boys had been looking for a fight when they took her home. Bob had told her that he'd fix us up for, for picking up his girl. His buddy, Randy Anderson, who had helped lump us, also said it was their fault and that we'd only fought back in self-defense, but they were charging Johnny with manslaughter. Then I discovered that I was supposed to appear in juvenile court for running away. And Johnny was too, if he recovered. Not if, I thought again. Why do I keep saying if? For once, there weren't any charges against Dally, and I knew he'd be mad because the paper made him out for being a hero for saving Johnny and didn't say much about his police record, which he was kind of proud of. He'd kill those reporters if he got a hold of him. There was another column about just Derry and Soda and me, how Derry worked two jobs at once and made good on both of them, and about his outstanding record at school. It mentioned Soda Pop dropping out of school so that we could stay together, and that I made honor roll at school all the time, and sorry, at school all the time and might be a future track star. Oh yeah, I forgot. I'm on the A squad track, track team, the youngest one. I'm a good runner. Then it said we shouldn't be separated after we'd worked so hard to stay together. The meaning of that last line finally hit me. You mean, I swallowed hard, that they're thinking of putting me and Soda in some boy's home or something? Steve was carefully combing back his hair in complicated swirls. Something like that. I sat down in a daze. We couldn't get hauled off now, not after me and Derry had finally gotten through to each other. And now that the big rumble was coming up and we, had, we would settle this so greaser thing once and for all. Not now, when Johnny needed us and Dally was in the hospital and wouldn't be out for the rumble. No, I said out loud, and Tubit, who was scraping the egg off the clock, turned to stare at me. No what? No, they ain't gonna put us in no boy's home. Don't worry about it, Steve said, cocksure that he and Soda Pop could handle anything that came up. They don't do things like that to heroes. Where's Soda and Superman? That was as far as he got because Derry, shaved and dressed, came in behind Steve and lifted him up off the f floor and then dropped him. We all called Derry Superman or Muscles at one time or another, but one time Steve made the mistake of referring to him as all brawn and no brain, and Derry almost shattered Steve's jaw. Steve didn't call him that again, and Derry never forgave him. Derry has never really gotten over not going to college. That was the only time I'd ever seen Soda mad at Steve, although Soda attaches no importance to education. School bored him. No action. Soda came running in. Where's the blue shirt I washed yesterday? He took a swig of chocolate milk out of the container. Hate to tell you, buddy, Steve said, still flat on the floor, but you have to wear clothes to work. There's a law or something. Oh yeah, Soda said. Where are those blue jeans, or wheat jeans, too? I ironed, they're in my closet, Derry said. Hurry up, you're gonna be late. Soda ran back, muttering, I'm hurrying, I'm hurrying. Steve followed him, and in a second, there was the gentle racket of a pillow fight. I absentmindedly watched Derry as he searched the ice box, box for chocolate cake. Derry, I said suddenly, did you know about the juvenile court? Without fuming to look at me, he said eventually, yeah, the cops told me last night. I knew then that he realized we might get separated. I didn't want to worry him anymore, but I said, I had one of those dreams last night, the one I can't ever remember. Derry spun around to face me, genuine fear on his face. What? I had a nightmare the night of mom and dad's funeral. I had nightmares and wild dreams every once in a while when I was little, but nothing like this one. I woke up screaming bloody murder, and I never could remember what it was that had scared me. It scared Soda Pop and Derry almost as bad as it scared me. For night after night, for weeks on end, I would dream this dream and wake up in a cold sweat or screaming. And I never could remember exactly what happened. Soda began sleeping with me and it stopped recurring so often, but it happened often enough for Derry to take me to a doctor. The doctor said I had too much imagination. He had a simple cure too: study harder, read more, draw more, and play football more. After a hard game of football and four or five hours of reading, I was too exhausted, mentally and physically, to dream anything. But Derry had never gotten over it, and every once in a while he would ask me if I ever dreamed anymore. Was it very bad? Tubit questioned. He knew the whole story, and having never dreamed about anything but blondes, he was interested. No, I lied. I had awakened in a cold sweat and shivering, but Soda was dead to the world. I had just wiggled closer to him and stayed awake for a couple of hours, trembling under his arm. That dream always scared the heck out of me. Derry started to say something, but before he could begin, Soda Pop and Steve came in. You know what, Soda Pop said to no one in particular, when we stump the so she's good, me and Stevie here are gonna throw 
a big party and everyone can get stoned. Then we'll chase the socias clear to Mexico. Where are you going to get the dough, little man? Derry had found the cake and was handing out pieces. I'll think of something, Soda Pop assured us between bites. You going to take Sandy to the party? I asked, just to be saying something. Instant silence. I looked around. What's the deal? Soda Pop was staring at his feet, but his ears were reddening. No, she went to live with her grandmother in Florida. How come? Look, Steve said, surprisingly angry. Does he have to draw you a picture? It was either that or get married, and her parents almost hit the roof of the idea of her marrying a 16-year-old kid. 17, Soda Pop said softly. I'll be 17 in a couple weeks. Oh, I said, embarrassed. Soda was no innocent. I had been in on business, er, on bowl sessions, and his bragging was as loud as anyone's, but never about Sandy, not ever about Sandy. I remembered how her blue eyes had glowed when she looked at him, and I was sorry for her. There was a heavy silence. Then Derry said, we'd better get to work, Pepsi Cola. Derry rarely called Soda by dad's pet nickname for him, but he did so then because he knew how miserable Soda Pop was about Sandy. I hate to leave you here by yourself, pony boy, Derry said slowly. Maybe I ought to take the day off. I've stayed by my lonesome before. You can't afford a day off. Yeah, but you just got back and I really ought to stay. I'll babysit him, Tubit said, ducking as I took a swing at him. I haven't got anything better to do. Why don't you get a job, Steve said. Ever consider working for a living? Work, Tubit was aghast, and ruin my rep? I wouldn't be babysitting the kid here if I had some good day nursery open on sun, uh, Saturdays. I pulled his chair over backward and jump on him, jumped on him, but he had me down in a second. I was kind of short of wind. I've got to cut out smoking or I won't make track next year. Holler, uncle. Nope, I said, struggling, but I didn't have my usual strength. Derry was pulling on his jacket. You two do up these dishes. You can go to the movies if you want before you go see Dally and Johnny. He paused for a second, watching Tubit squash the heck out of me. Tubit, lay off. He ain't looking so good. Pony boy, you take a couple of aspirins and go easy. You smoke more than a pack today and I'll skin you. Understood? Yeah, I said, getting to my feet. You carry more than one bundle of roofing at a time today and me and Soda will skin you. Understood? He grinned one of his rare grins. Yeah, see all this afternoon. Bye, I said. I heard our Ford's vroom and I thought, Soda's driving, and they left. Anyway, I was walking around downtown and I started to take this shortcut through the alley. Tubit was telling me one of his many exploits while we did the dishes. I mean, while I did the dishes. He was sitting on the cabinet sharpening that black-handled switchblade he was so proud of. And I ran into three guys. I says, howdy, and they just look at each other. Then one says, we would jump you, but since you're as slick as we figure, you ain't got nothing worth taking. I says, buddy, that's the truth, and went right on. Moral, what's the safest thing to be when one is met by a gang of social outcasts in an alley? A judo expert, I suggested. No, another social outcast. Tubit yelped and nearly fell off the cabinet from laughing so hard. I had to grin too. He saw things straight and made them into something funny. We're going to clean up the house, I said. The reporters or police or somebody, or somebody might come by. And anyway, it's time for those guys from the state to come by and check up on us. This house ain't messy. You ought to see my house. I have, and if you had the sense of a billy goat, you'd try to help around your place instead of bumming around. Shoot, kid, if I ever did that, my mom would die of shock. I liked Tubit's mother. She had the same good humor and easygoing ways that he did. She wasn't lazy like him, but she let him get away with murder. I don't know, though. It's just about impossible to get mad at him. When we had finished, I pulled on Dally's, Dally's brown leather jacket. The back was burned black, and we started off for 10th Street. I would drive us, Tubit said, as we were walking up the street trying to thumb a ride. But the brakes are out of my car. Almost killed me and Kathy the other night. He flipped up the collar of his black leather jacket up to serve as a windbreak while he lit a cigarette. You ought to see Kathy's brother. Now there's a hood. He's so greasy he glides when he walks. He goes to the barber for an oil change, not a haircut. I would have laughed, but I had a terrific headache. We stopped at the Tasty Freeze to buy Cokes and rest up, and the blue Mustang that had been trailing us for eight blocks pulled in. I almost decided to run, and Tubit must have guessed this, for he shook his head ever so slightly and tossed me a cigarette. As I lit up, the socias who had jumped Johnny and me had, at the park hopped out of the Mustang. I recognized Randy Anderson, Marsha's boyfriend, as the tall guy that had almost drowned me. I hated him. Or them. It was their fault that Bob was dead. Their fault that Johnny was dying. Their fault Soda and I might get put into a boy's home. I hated them as bitterly and as, as contemptuously as Dallas Winston hated. Tubit put an elbow on my shoulder and leaned against me, dragging on his cigarette. 
You know the rules, no jazz before the rumble, he said to the socias. We know, Randy said. He looked at me. Come here, I want to talk to you. I glanced at Tubit. He shrugged. I followed Randy over to his car, out of earshot of the rest. We sat there in his car for a second, silent. Golly, that was the toughest car I'd ever seen or been in. I read about you in the paper, Randy said finally. How come? I don't know. Maybe I felt like playing hero. I wouldn't have. I would have let those kids burn to death. You might not have. You might have done the same thing. Randy pulled out a cigarette and pressed in the car lighter. I don't know. I don't know anything anymore. I would never have believed that a greaser could pull off something like that. Greaser didn't have anything to do with it. My buddy over there wouldn't have done it. Maybe you would have done the same thing, and maybe a friend of yours wouldn't have. It's the individual. I'm not going to show at the Rumble tonight, Randy said slowly. I took a good look at him. He was 17 or so, but he was already old, like Dally, Dallas was old. Cherry said that her friends were too cool to feel anything, and yet she could remember watching sunsets. Randy was supposed to be too cool to feel anything, and yet there was pain in his eyes. I'm sick of all this, sick and tired. Bob was a good guy. He was the best buddy a guy ever had. I mean, he was a good fighter and tough and everything, but he was a real person, too. You dig? I nodded. He's dead. His mother has had a nervous breakdown. They spoiled him rotten. I mean, most parents would be proud of a kid like that, good looking and smart and everything, but they gave in to him all the time. He kept trying to make somebody say no, and they never did. They never did. That was what he wanted, for someone to tell him no, to have somebody lay down the law, set the limits, give him something solid to stand on. That's all he wanted, really. One time, Randy tried to grin, but I could tell he was close to tears. One time he came home drunker than anything. He thought sure they were going to raise the roof. You know what they did? They thought it was something they'd done. They thought it was their fault. They thought they'd failed him and driven him into it or something. They took all the blame and didn't do anything to him. If his old, if his old man had just belted him just once, he might still be alive. I don't know why I'm telling you this. I couldn't tell anyone else. My friends, they'd think I was off my rocker or turning soft. Maybe I am. I just know that I'm sick of this whole mess. That kid, your buddy, the one that got burned, he might die? Yeah, I said, trying not to think about Johnny. And tonight, people get hurt in rumbles, maybe killed. I'm sick of it because it doesn't do any good. You can't win, you know that? Or you know that, don't you? And when I remained silent, he went on. You can't win, even if you whip us. You'll still be where you were before, at the bottom. And we'll be the lucky ones with all the breaks. So it doesn't do any good, the fighting and the killing. It doesn't prove a thing. We'll forget it if you win or if you don't. Greasers will still be greasers and socias will still be socias. Sometimes I think it's the ones in the middle that are really the lucky stiffs. He took a deep breath. So I'd fight if I thought it would do any good. I think I'm going to leave town, take my little old Mustang and all the dough I can carry and get out. Running away won't help. Oh, hell, I know it, Randy half sobbed. But what can I do? I'm marked chicken if I punk out at the rumble, and I'd hate myself if I didn't. I don't know what to do. I'd help you if I could, I said. I remembered Cherry's voice. Things are rough all over. I knew then what she meant. He looked at me. No, you wouldn't. I'm a soche. You get a little money and the whole world hates you. No, I said you hate the whole world. He just looked at me. From the way he looked, he could have been 10 years older than he was. I got out of the car. You would have saved those kids if you had been there, I said. You'd have saved them just the same as we did. Thanks, Grease, he said, trying to grin. Then he stopped. I didn't mean that. I meant thanks, kid. My name's Ponyboy, I said. Nice talking to you, Randy. I walked over to Tubit, and Randy honked for his friends to come and get into the car. What did he want, Tubit asked. What did Mr. Super Soch have to say? He ain't a Soch, I said. He's just a guy. He just wanted to talk. You want to see a movie before we go see Johnny in Dallas? Nope, I said, lighting up another weed. I still had a headache, but I felt better. Soches were just guys, after all. Things were rough all over, but it was better that way. That way, you could tell the other guy was human, too.